Andrew Phipps, and I'm so glad today that you have joined us. I think we will have an exciting program relative to faith, family, and freedom. Recently, I was privileged to go to Washington, D.C., as I often do, and uh, there for the opening or the inauguration of the um, Advanced American Freedom Facility on Pennsylvania Avenue, my good friend Mike Pence was there, and Mike was so gracious, and he gave us a little interview talking about his Christian testimony. Let's join in on that conversation. Well, I'm here with my good friend Mike Pence. Mike, this organization, Advanced American Freedom, I'm excited about it. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for making the trip out to Washington, D.C. We both made the trip. You know, yeah. Karen and I are back in Indiana now, but we intend to stay in the fight on behalf of everything that's always made this country great. A strong national defense, supporting law enforcement, free market economics, but most importantly, our commitment to religious liberty, the right to life, traditional values. And I want to thank you for being such a great champion of those values for all the years we've known each other. Oh, thank you, my friend. Well, you know, I think we really need uh, Mike Pence, a spiritual awakening in America, and your strong defense of Christian values and your expression as a believer in Christ. What a testimony to so many. It encourages me, it encourages the folks out there. So many will come to me and say, if you see Mike Pence, be sure and tell him that we appreciate his stand for biblical principles and our great Judeo-Christian values. Thank you, Andrew. Well, you've been a great friend for more than 20 years. Right, we right. cherish you and your family and your voice. And, and I can tell you, I would say to any one of your friends and anyone looking on, there's not a day gone by over the last five years that we haven't felt the prayers of believers around this country. And that's my last word. I would just Tell you, we're going to be in the fight for freedom. I know you're going to be in the fight for our values, but how about if I can help you and maybe everyone we can... to keep praying for America because God is not done with America yet. And we can help each other, can't we? We can. We can. We can pray. You're my friend, my brother. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Good to be with you. When I was teaching, I was always impressed with the quotes and the great knowledge of the African American economist Thomas Sowell who was born in North Carolina, and at this point in his life, he's about 91 years of age, but he always told common sense, I thought, and what he says makes sense. Sowell, Thomas Sowell is quoted as saying, there are only two ways of telling the truth, anonymously and posthumously. He said, the problem isn't that Johnny can't read, the problem isn't even that Johnny can't think. The problem is that Johnny doesn't know what thinking is. He confuses it with feelings. Another quote by Thomas Sowell, he said, despite a voluminous and often fervent literature on income distribution, the cold fact is most income is not distributed, it is earned. Well, to me, this makes sense. And I think he just hits the economic topics head on, and his logic is just so almost irrefutable. Another great lesson that I got from him was this. He said, some of the biggest cases of mistaken identity are among intellectuals who have trouble remembering that they're not God. He also said socialism is a wonderful idea. It is only as a reality that it has been disastrous. And I think that goes along with the late uh, Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister of Great Britain, who said the thing with socialism is that soon you run out of other people's money. Thomas Sowell, in one of his lectures, also said this, the first lesson of scarcity, there is never enough of anything to satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. Then he said, since this is an era when many people are concerned about fairness and social justice, what is your fair share of what someone else has worked for? Doesn't that seem to make sense? 
And yet we hear the academia and those out of the liberal colleges and those that want a redistribution of wealth, that want to basically redistribute your wealth. They always are trying to come up with terms like equity and so on. One fellow said this, and I don't believe in luck, but this fellow said, the harder I work, he said, the luckier I get. Well, Thomas Sowell, I think, and I appreciate him so much, he said, what sense would it make to classify a man as handicapped because he's in a wheelchair today if he is expected to be walking again in a month and competing in track meets before the year is over. Well, here again, his reasoning is just so impenetrable. I mean, he just comes right to the basis of everything, and he and, and uh, people like Milton Friedman, the great uh, economist who was uh, definitely a, a supply side economist who really felt that outcomes are not based upon social values or thoughts, but it's about what the reality of the situation is. Not that we shouldn't take into, into recognition values, obviously we should. Another thing that Thomas Sowell really hit hard on was, he said the concept of microaggression is just one of many tactics used to stifle differences of opinion by declaring some people's speech to be hate speech instead of debating those differences in a marketplace of ideas. What a wonderful thought. Wouldn't it be nice if we would just take a look at what people say rather than to put a label on it and call it something that it may not be at all, and that's what we see. If we tell the truth, if we have the facts to validate things, many people say, oh, we don't want to hear that. We just know that couldn't be right. Well, we're going to pursue more of these when we return, and we hope you'll be with us. that so many of you like me enjoy some good gospel singing. And I just feel like that in our Faith, Family, and Freedom program, that's a wonderful addition. Not too long ago, Rodney Griffin of Greater Vision wrote a great song for the Mark Trammell Quartet. Rodney is a tremendous writer, great Christian man, and my, he has written some of the best. And the Mark Trammell Quartet is going to sing that composition, the song simply says, Go ask Moses. Questions in life are common, answers are hard to find. So if you need a friend to call on, here's a name from days gone by. Moses, how it feels when God says, I'll depend on you. Go oh, ask Moses, how a foot's on fire will make you lose your shoes. Go oh, ask Moses, how it feels to watch as the mighty Red Sea closes. If you need another witness from another time and place, if you need a testimony of God's power and His grace, if you need to be reminded that God always makes a way, I'll give you a name, go ask Moses. Uh, yeah, that's right. Moses would feel unworthy to help save. i 
study economics and people start messing with the system of logic and they start trying to dictate outcomes and try to legislate outcomes and economics that's a very slippery slope we were talking about mr thomas Sowell, the great economist thomas Sowell made this statement he said to believe in personal responsibility would be to destroy the whole special role of the anointed, whose vision casts them in the role of rescuers of people treated unfairly by society. My, isn't that truth right there? We have so many today that are trying to uh, correct supposedly the ills and by legislation, they're trying to put people into groups. They're picking winners and losers they're trying to say, well, uh, if you belong in this group or in this class, you should be entitled to these situations. Wouldn't it just be wonderful if we could treat people with, with dignity and create the situation? For example, there was a quote by Mr. Walter Williams. See, he said this, what do the poor most need? And he said this, they need to stop being poor. Now that may seem a little bit heartless. It may seem a little bit callous, but the truth of the matter is that he's saying we don't change the situation until we want to change. The prodigal son never started for home until he got in the pig pen down there. And uh, I think that we have to be very careful, and we see it happening today with people trying to, uh, through legislation, to dictate by mandates what we can and can't do. I mean, uh, the great quotation by Benjamin Franklin still rings true in my mind. He said, those who give up permanent constitutional freedoms for temporary security deserve neither liberty nor security. John Adams, one of the great promoters of the Constitution, said this, a Constitution once changed from freedom can never be restored. Liberty, once lost, is lost forever. Isn't that a striking comment to think about it? I mean, for example, I want to share with you that if you took eight zeros off of the national budget, a family income would be reduced down to $21,700. But the family spends $38,200 annually. They have a debt on their credit card of $16,500, but they have a balance from previous spending of $142,710 and they want to cut the budget <laughs> by $38.50. Now that's emblematic of what we see with the federal budget if we put it in terms of a family budget. 
And I think when you remove the eight zeros and pretend it's a household budget, we can't print this kind of money. We can't tax because we're individuals and it should be illegal for the government to do so. And we'll return after these announcements. Adrian Rogers, who was pastor of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, had a lot of great quotations that people still remember. Adrian Rogers said, talking about the times that we would face, he said the time would come when there would be uh, anarchy in the government, there'd be apostasy in the pulpits, and apathy in the pews. Adrian Rogers, in commenting about the financial or the economic climate, had a quotation that I think we all need to address. And we need to take this and consider it. Adrian Rogers simply said this. He said, you cannot legislate the poor into prosperity by legislating the wealthy out of prosperity. He said, the very moment that you take from others and give to others that don't earn and contribute. He said, then democracy is in peril. I think that's altogether relevant for us. I think that when we have destroyed the work ethic, the idea that a man should provide for his own family, that he ought to, uh, the Bible said that he that will provide not for his own is worse than an infidel and having denied the faith. Well, I know that this country was built upon the labor and the contributions of others. And people didn't always look for a handout. They weren't looking for a government subsidy. They weren't looking for an entitlement program. They weren't looking to some bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. or elsewhere to support their families. People did what they could under the conditions. They worked. They uh, contributed, they went to their respective jobs and vocations or professions, and they did according to their abilities and according to what they had made preparation. I think it would do us well in this country to revisit some of the old-fashioned ideas. We must get it in the minds of our young people that there is no such thing as a free lunch. Nowhere are we to uh, promulgate that idea or to make it the capstone of our living. I just think that there are so many great opportunities that we all have, and if we'll take advantage of them, we can make a great contribution to not only ourselves and to our families and communities, but we can be in accord with the biblical mandates of having a profitable life, of doing something that helps people. We can't all just sit in the hammock and stay there and expect others to come by and provide for us. If you took all the wealth of all the billionaires, all of the billionaires in America, it would only fund the government for maybe, I believe, 80-some days. If you took every penny of all the billionaires in America. It would only fund the government for just uh, maybe 85 days or something like that. In other words, it takes everybody. Nobody should look for that way of getting, shirking our responsibilities. And I'll say more about it when we come back in the next segment. Hello friends, this is Andrew Phipps, and I believe that we need all of the materials that we can gather to help us as we combat the attack upon our faith, our family, and our freedoms. We need to be educated, and I have a handbook that has been given 
to state legislatures. It's been given to members of Congress. It's a colorfully created handbook that has graphs, charts, quotes, and different things in it. You'll be impressed with it. And also, we have DVDs. We have CDs that are God and Country, Return to Greatness, and Faith, Family, and Freedom, some other wonderful materials. See the contact information on the screen. Be sure that you order some because these will be of a tremendous help. They are supplemental materials to help you in your Christian walk. And may God bless. I think that's why we're seeing so many mandates today. It's about government control. I think when you are firing people for not wearing a mask or telling people that it's a requirement for them to keep their job, that's overstepping government authority. Freedom politically is also freedom financially or economically. To make choices, that's what we call free enterprise, private ownership of property, the idea of competition, the idea of the marketplace. And so when we see these managers or the bureaucrats or those in authority that want to tell us what we have to do constantly, even if the science is not there, and it isn't, the science is not there, better minds than mine are have done the research, and we know that it's basically a control thing where the government simply says, hey, if you're going to be a policeman, you're going to be a nurse, a hospital worker, you're going to go to school, you've got to obey. What would be the next thing that might become mandatory? I think when people say, this is my body, this is my choice, I think that has validity here in this case. We're not talking about the life of the unborn or something. We're talking about what you are forced to take supposedly for your good. And when the government determines what is good for you, let's beware. They can't speak with that certainty. We're always, oh, must be very leery of when the government says this is for the better good. That reminds me of some of the history I have read about in the past. Once again, remember that Adrian Rogers said you cannot legislate the poor into prosperity by legislating the wealthy out of prosperity. What one person receives without working for, another person must work for without receiving. The government cannot give, cannot give anybody anything that the government does not first take from someone else. When half of the people get the idea that they do not have to work because the other half is going to take care of them, and when the other half gets the idea that it does no good to work because somebody else is going to get what they work for, then that, my dear friend, is the beginning of the end of any nation. You cannot multiply wealth by dividing it. I hope that some of the statistics today and the quotes will be a benefit. Maybe it'll make us all think. I just know, I believe that the, the best government is the least government. Government should be kept to a minimum in the interference of people's lives and the interactions of the economic good of the society. And we've seen it abused like never before. We've seen these mandates and all of the uh, recycling and re getting, uh, getting all the wagons recircled and all like that. I think most people are very tired of it. And it's up to me and you to speak out against it and to cry, and to cry aloud against what we see, the abuses. Freedom once lost can never be regained. And I'm fearful that's what we're seeing in this country, an abuse of power. Power tends to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Give any person too much power and it will be abused. And it's irrespective 
of their political affiliation. That's just the way of human nature. Friends, I hope that you've enjoyed the program today. Be sure that if you think this program is what we need, help us if you can financially. We need it. We would appreciate it. We'll thank you. But I'm going to be looking forward to being with you again at the next opportunity. And this is Andrew Phipps, hoping that you have a wonderful day. Phipps Faith, Family, and Freedom, presented by Clemens Home Solutions and Heritage Funeral Care.